have Joe as an educator from the Master Education, um, education Group, and we have Emily, who's an intern. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Yeah, so uh, feel free to take, take any pictures of her you want. Don't worry about flash. They actually can't see it. Um, so we'll get to that a little bit later in the program. Uh, so as she said, my name is Joel Crumry, and I'm a staff member at the Raptor Education Group, or Reggie. You hear me call it Reggie a lot. Um, I am one of the staff members there. I'm also one of the bird trainers. Um, so we take birds that come out of the wild that have a permanent injury, uh, and we train them to be comfortable around people. Um, and so that's kind of what you're going to see today. And I have Emily uh, with me today. She's going to help out a little bit during the program. Um, she's one of our interns for the fall. We actually have three um, interns for the fall. And we do do a summer internship. So if you know of anybody um, interested in birds or wildlife rehabilitation, um, we do do a summer internship. Um, we do work with the college here at Stevens Point um, very well with having interns. I think three out of our seven um, last summer were from Point. Um, so we did have summer, seven summer interns, um, and we had two educators and five rehab summer interns. Um, so that's a little bit about us. A little bit more about Reggie and kind of what we do before we, you've got to wait your turn, um, <laughs> before we kind of get started with the birds. Um, the Raptor Education Group, or Reggie, it was started in 1990 uh, by Marge and Don Gibson. Now, Marge Gibson was originally from Anago. That's where we're located now. Um, she grew up there, went to high school there, graduated. And then when she went to college, she moved out to California um, just to pursue a degree in wildlife. That's what her, her heart has always been. Um, so she ran a raptor rehabilitation center out there for many, many years. And in Marge's retirement, she moved back to Anago because she wanted to be a little bit closer to her family. Her mom and dad were still alive at the time. Um, and she started the Raptor Education Group Incorporated, uh, with a key word in there being education. So primarily what we do now is rehabilitation. It's kind of backwards from where she wanted to go. Uh, but if you guys have ever seen the movie Field of Dreams, what's the key line in the movie Field of Dreams? Yeah, if you build it, they will come. And boy, did they come. She did not know the scale of which birds were going to come to her. Okay, the first year people brought her so many injured birds she didn't know what to do with. And so Reggie, the education, the raptor education group has kind of evolved over time to accommodate all these injured raptors and all these injured birds that come into this center. Okay, at this very moment, how many did we count up today, eagles? I think we had 31. We have 31 eagles in our care right now at our facility. And that's just eagles. That's all bald eagles. At any, at any moment, we may easily have between 150 and 200 patients on hand at all times. We go through over 1,000 pounds of meat a week. That's how many birds we take care of. And when Marge originally started Reggie, she wanted five birds. That's what she wanted. She wanted a couple of hawks, she wanted a couple of owls, a couple of falcons just to do this, to educate people. And now, most of our staff is dedicated to rehabilitation, and we have two educators. That's me and my wife, Abby. We are the educators at Reggie. So, we take care of anywhere from eight to 1,000 patients a year, 800 to 1,000 patients a year. Um, we have a 75% success rate of the diesel. Um, so that's amazingly good compared to other success rates. So, I think somebody wants to call. Um, so, what we're gonna, do you have a question? Okay. What we're going to do here today is I do got a bunch of birds uh, to show you guys. Uh, just wait. Jeez. Um, all of these birds you see today have been injured or do have something wrong with them that they cannot be released back to the wild. If you think about it, if we did have an injured bird up here, we don't want to subject them to people as much as possible because we want them to return to the wild. Okay? So all of our patients are in their own flights, away from human contact. These birds, we have trained these birds, we work these birds every day to be comfortable around people. So all these birds have an injury um, that's related to them. And the first bird I'm going to bring out is in this box right here. Okay? And she is going to be a species of hawk. Now you guys are part of the Audubon Society, right? You should be able to name all seven species of hawks. We have Wisconsin. We do have seven. So who has a guess what bird is in this box? Oh, Reggie. 
Could tell be a very good guess. You got the most common bird, right? So that's a good guess. What are the other six species? Red shouldered, shark shin, cougars, goshawk, Broadway. Broadway. Yep. Uh, I think that's it. Is that seven? No, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to count. But we will pull our first bird out here. She stops standing on her leash and wakes up. Big girl. Come on, step up. And we'll see if you guys can identify this bird. This is our first bird. What kind of bird is it? Yeah, you can see right here, right where she gets her name. Red tailed hawk. Okay? So I'll walk her around, don't worry, I'll get closer. Um, her name is Juliet. And Juliet is a western red tailed hawk. She's actually from Southern California. Remember Marge did a major amount of her work in her early years in Southern California. She ran a rehab center down there. Um, Juliet is actually the first bird that Reggie has ever had as an education bird. Okay, so Juliet is 25 years old. Wow. And she looks a little bit different than the red tails we have around here. Um, if you take a look at red tails around here, they are an eastern red tail. Okay, they have a very white upper chest with a dark belly band, that's their signature, and then a white lower. Her chest is completely burnt orange. And she's a beautiful coloration. She does get a little bit of a crop from a meal she ate. So I think it's, I think it's actually beef heart. <laughs> you can see that's that lump in her chest. That's that meat getting stored in her crop, getting ready for it to be digested. That's what that little, little weird feather is sticking out in this lump is right here. <laughs> so, red tails um, are a prime example of a raptor. They are what we educate about, and they are kind of one of the iconic birds. They are the most common raptor um, throughout the country, and they are easily seen by lots of people. Sitting on telephone poles, uh, fence posts, right downtown Milwaukee, you can see them in the media. But there are three main characteristics that make a raptor a raptor. Are you going to talk to now? Everybody's loud today. She will talk. Um, she hasn't screamed yet, but she will do a little bit, a little scream. We'll see if she'll do it today. Uh, but there are three main characteristics that make raptors raptors. If you think of a robin, a robin's not a raptor. They don't have these three characteristics. So what's one of the three characteristics? Talent. Yeah, well... I want to get the meat eater first. Meat eater is very good, but what does a robin eat? Worms. Yeah, what's a worm? A worm's meat, right? And there's a lot of things like bluebirds eat primarily insects. Insects are technically protein, they're meat. Uh, so meat isn't the main characteristic, but talents. Definitely talents are. And she's going to poop now, probably. Oh, that was a good, one. good thing you missed my shoe. Uh, but talent, yeah, think of a robin having talons. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Talents are what, one of the primary things that actually the word raptor comes from. The word raptor comes from the Latin word rapier, which means to grip or to grasp. And that's exactly what they do with their talons, okay? Look at the size of her toenails, the size of her talons. Yeah. She has enough power, enough gripping strength in her feet to punch right through this leather glove and go directly into my meat and my bones. And she can, if, if she wanted to, she does have enough strength in her talons to break the bones in my fingers. She's got enough crushing power to do that. Now think of something the size of a bald eagle. When we're working with eagles, we wear gloves lined with Kevlar. You know, Kev Kevlar is that bulletproof stuff that cops wear? Yeah, we wear gloves lined with Kevlar. Because eagles have such a strong gripping power, they have 400 pounds per square inch in each toe. That's not per foot, that's per talent. So an eagle has enough power in their feet to snap the bones in your lower arm. That's how they kill things. If you think about it, she's not tickling a rabbit to death. She's going to go down and grab a hold of it and squeeze it. That's how they kill their prey. Now she's, a rabbit is about the, thank you, Look at this nice intern. <laughs> 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 there are a lot of 
could be able to be some more there too. So you think about a red tail. They're going to eat anything from a rabbit on down. Um, small rodents, rabbits, they do take some birds like pheasants sometimes. Um, that's their primary diet. Okay? So definitely those talons are one major aspect. What's the second one? A hook beak. Yeah, so think of a robin again. We're used to, we'll keep using that bird. Um, robin's beak sticks straight out in front of his face. A woodpecker, chickadee. Um, but what are those birds eating? They're eating seeds, they're eating other animals that they don't have to rip apart. If she catches a rabbit, she's not going to be able to swallow a rabbit bowl. So she's going to have to use that beak like a fork and a knife. She hooks into it and breaks her prey open and tears off small pieces and swallows them whole. Mm -hmm. Now something the size of a little mouse or something like that, she probably could swallow whole. Uh, but again, she's going to be catching chipmunks, squirrels, rabbits. She needs that hook beak to rip and tear. They have very strong neck muscles so they can rip and tear very effectively. That's why we're kind of trained as bird handlers, that when we're working with a new bird, if we get bit, so say I'm pointing stuff out, or I'm doing a medical check on her, if I get bit, I don't go like this. Because if I get bit, and she hooks into me, I'm pulling away, I'm tearing exactly what that beak's designed to do. Okay? And I have done that. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. Um, especially with an eagle. Uh, they got such big beaks, and their beaks are, are pretty powerful. Uh, we, by far, humans have a lot stronger of a bite force than a raptor does, um, but that hook is so sharp, they hook into you and you pull your pieces off. So that's the second thing. So we got talons, we got a beak, a hook beak. What's the next one? Yeah, that she's pointing at her eyes. And that's right, their eyesight. Now, it's not good eyesight. It's not great eyesight. It's amazing eyesight. Okay? She can see a rabbit-sized object at a distance of two miles. If you had the same size eyes and the same type of abilities as a raptor, you could read a newspaper from a football field away. Now, some of us can't read a newspaper from three feet. That's right. Some of us have to be a little bit closer. You could read it at over a newspaper, or not over a newspaper, at over a football field away. That's amazing vision. Okay. They also have two fovea. Fovea are the centers of focus in your eyes. We have one set of fovea. It's straight ahead. And we see a 3D picture. We can see depth of field. We can see how far away something is. A red tail has that same depth of field vision. But they also have a fovea 45 degrees up each side of their head. So when they're flying and they're scanning, they can create a one-dimensional picture in a panoramic view. And that's a high attention to movement type of vision. Okay, so when she's flying, scanning the grass, she catches a little shimmer of a tree branch or a little shimmer of a rabbit or a squirrel. She can switch her field of view to look at that rabbit and go, ah, that's too close to a brush pile. I'm never going to make it there in time. Then she can switch her phobia back to the panoramic view and keep flying. Then she sees a little mouse or something out in the open. She can switch to that 3D view. She can judge how far away it is. She can figure out how fast she needs to fly. And she does have a zoom capability. So she can actually zoom into her target and look at high definition. She's watching HDTV all the time. So she can look at a high definition picture of how big that animal actually is and calculate her trajectory to go get it. It's just amazing what these animals can do. Yeah, she's, I mean, she zoomed into everybody's forehead, looked at that little dirty core right there, and it zoomed out again. She, they, it's, it's just amazing just to be this close to them and watch their eyes focus. Their eyes are so fast and they process so much information. It's just amazing. And talk about intelligence. I'll just go off on this little tangent. They have an amazing sense of intelligence. Now, it's not like Juliet's day. <laughs> Sit. You know, it's not that type of intelligence. You think of like a dog. You know, they have a command-based intelligence. Sit, stay, down, roll over. They can learn those words. They can learn those commands and, and do them pretty effectively. Her intelligence is in problem solving. Her intelligence is on the same line as a Labrador Retriever. Okay? But not in terms of Juliet Cump. You know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work that way, does it? No. In terms of figuring out trajectory, how fast I need to fly in order for me to get to that, what angle, how high I am, doing that all like that, it's amazingly smart.
amazingly intelligent, amazingly intelligent animals. And you can just see it. They look right through you. I mean, they look at you and like, yeah, you're nothing. <laughs> Keep looking. So, so a little bit more about Juliet. Um, again, she's from uh, Southern California, and she was originally shot by some young kids. Some young kids are out either messing around or they're out hunting. Uh, and they decided to shoot her. And then afterwards, they have the aftermath. Like, oh, I could get in trouble for this. So they actually grabbed her up and kept her in their garage. Figuring that if I keep her, if we keep her under wraps, no one's going to find out. And we're not going to get in trouble. Well, eventually somebody found out. They got a hold of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They went and confiscated her from those little boys. Um, and the little boys got, I don't know what they got. They got in trouble, I'm sure. Um, and then she was given to Marge because she had a broken scapula. She had a broken shoulder. Um, and so she can't fly any longer, even though she does have the full use of both her wings. She does have and She can fly a ways. She can maybe make it across this room. Uh, but it, after a while, after she flies, her wings really do start to droop. You can just see that that bone isn't quite healed right. And now in birds, they can heal a, a complete break in 10 days. Now how, how long do you have your arm in a cast? <laughs> Six, eight weeks, yeah, depending on the type of break. If they break a major bone like the humerus bone in her arm, in her wing, 10 days it will be healed. But if it's not set right, like those boys kept her for a long period of time, she never could heal right. So she is one of our permanent. She is technically retired, but I brought her out of retirement tonight to come see you guys. She does like to go. She does like to show off and talk to you guys. Um, so we got to see her. So anybody any questions about red tails or Julia? Yeah. So many birds came to your life. Maybe yeah. So mated for mating for life is one of those tricky things to kind of to kind of not only talk about but to kind of explain. Um, so take a bald eagle. Bald eagles are like the prime example. Well, they mate for life. They never find another partner. Blah blah blah. <laughs> Not quite true. Uh, it depends on your definition of mated for life. My my personal definition for mated for life is you find one partner, and that's it. If your partner dies, you stay alone. That's my personal definition. Okay, that's not what a dictionary. That's not what anybody else thinks. That's what I think. Okay. I find you, you're my perfect partner, Juliet. If you die, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm never going to find anybody else. That's my, that's my definition. To a hawk, to an eagle, that doesn't make sense. If a, if a partner does come back year after year, and we can get together, and we can produce viable clutches of eggs, let's do it. But if you happen to die on migration, I'm not going to wait for you. <laughs> I'm going to go find somebody else again. So, to, so to answer your question more definitely, they do tend to stay with the same partner year after year after year. Once they find a good mate and they can have successful nest clutches with them, they do, yes, they do tend to stay year after year with that same partner. If one partner dies, if one partner happens to find a better partner, whatever, they're not going to stay alone. They will go out and find somebody else. That's kind of a long, long way to answer a short question. But, Yes. Uh, can the uh, eastern and western interbreed? I believe so. Um, they're not. They're kind of just geographically separated. They're not genetically separate species. They're just kind of subspecies of the, of the red-tailed hawk. Uh, so I do believe they can mate with each other. Yep. It's just kind of a color difference in them. Yeah. I'm a little curious about. Do you have an opportunity to go into schools and share your birds with? young people, or is it mostly they come to you, or how does that work? So, I'm going to go ahead and put her away while I answer. Uh, we do both. Okay, so we do, we do a lot of programs like this, um, where we go out to different schools, different events, churches, I mean, Boy Scout groups, really anything. Um, get your tail, I want to crush your tail in there. Um, right now, at this minute, we do run, um, at this time point in our life of Reggie, so to speak, we do run summer tours. Um, they're on Tuesday and Thursday of every week. Um, they're unfortunately over right now, so it's getting into fall, unfortunately. Um, we do run summer tours Tuesdays and Thursdays of every week, um, and that's the only really opportunity they have to come to us um, right now. In future plans for Reggie in our growth, we are planning on having a classroom and everything like that. Uh, but for right now, we're most strictly going to 
DC Ever School for us, Wausau School for us. We come to Point. I do several programs at the college here at Point every year for their natural resources clubs and stuff like that. Um, so we're doing a lot of traveling right now. Uh, but in future plans, yes, people will be able to come to us. But, um, I'm going to have Emily step up and help me out. Uh, the next species of bird we're going to get out is a type of falcon. Okay, and we have three. This should be hard to name. What are they? Peregrine falcon, I heard kestrel, American kestrel is the third one. The merlin, okay, and the ever so faint jeer falcon every once in a while. And that's on my life list, you know, way up here. Um, but uh, we do have the three species. Um, and he's going to get out our first species of falcon. And his name is going to be Benji. Um, and he's going to tie one, yeah. The first thing our interns learn in handling birds is how to tie a one handed falcon or snot. And it is a little bit tricky, especially when you're in front of people staring at you. <laughs> Give her a little bit of encouragement clap. There we go. She'll get her down. And we'll wait for Benji to come up. Any other questions while her? What was the life expectancy on birds? Yeah, so life expectancy on, well, on a red tail for sure, and on most birds of prey. Um, in most birds, the bigger the bird, the longer the lifespan in most raptors. So something like Juliet, uh, red tail, they'll live to be. 15 in the wild is a very old red tail. Um, 15, 18, 20, you know, it's all dependent on certain circumstances. In captivity, however, we can easily double their lifespan. So a 15 long captivity bird can live to their 30. Um, so Juliet's getting up there in age, but she does have a couple of good years left. Her. So that little guy's Benji. He's a cute little guy, yep. And Benji is an American kestrel. Uh, he is a male, you can walk around, yeah. He's a male American kestrel. Um, and kestrels are neat little dudes. They are the smallest falcon in North America. Um, and they are known for hovering. That's the coolest thing I think about a kestrel. They can hover, they can stay in one spot. And they actually have the ability, as you watch Benji walk around, take a look at his head. His head will stop and his body will move. I can't even do it. His body will move underneath his head. He's going to do a rouse, yeah? Then you move his, your hand back and forth. See his body move independently of his head? So when he's hovering over a field looking for small mice or insects, he can hover and pinpoint exactly what he's looking at without moving his head. It's just amazing. Now something like a peregrine falcon, they're the fastest animal on the planet. And I do this with a lot of kid groups. So what's the fastest animal on the planet? A cheetah, right? How fast does a cheetah go? They go 65, 70 miles an hour, somewhere in there. What's the fastest animal on the planet? The peregrine falcon. And how fast can a peregrine falcon go? Yeah, 246. A park and fall can go 246 miles an hour without losing control. They have speculated that they can go faster, but at which speed they cannot control themselves anymore. Are you talking something weighing two pounds? Going 200 miles an hour. That's an amazing feat of aerodynamics and physics. Okay? Peregrines kind of cheat to get that fast. One, their body shape is just like a bullet. They tuck their wings in. If you look at Benji, he's got really long pointed wings that fold perfectly behind him. And when he's diving, they go right down next to their body. In fact, the U.S. Air Force is designing an airplane to move their wings in and out just like falcons. So they can go faster and faster and faster. Peregrines also dive in a spiral. And they use centrifugal force to help them go faster and faster and faster. Now when they get to their target, a peregrine is going to be, hunt, hunt, going to be hunting something the size of a pigeon, a duck, um, a larger bird species. When they get to their prey going 200 miles an hour, they reach out to grab it, well, what happened to their toes? They break them, right? If they try to grab something out of the air with their long slender toes, they're going to break their toes going 200 miles an hour. So what does a peregrine do? They ball their feet. So when they hit their target going 200, they literally knock it out of the sky. They literally punch it 
out of the air. It works in the same principle as you getting pushed over when you're running. You get so much forward momentum, you get pushed, you're never going to regain that balance again. So they'll knock a pigeon out and either knock it out, stun it, or they'll kill it just with the force of the hip. And then they'll fly around, they'll fly around, and then they'll land on it. And I don't know if you can see on Benji because he's got such a small beak, but another thing all falcons have is called a tomial tube. Okay? And so outside of the sharp point, it's a notch halfway back in their beak. It's called a tomial tooth, and that is designed, the space between the point of the beak and that notch is exactly the right width to fit in the cervical vertebrae of their prey. So when he hits a pigeon, and maybe doesn't kill it, he circles around, grabs it on the ground, and fights it behind the neck. And falcons have amazingly strong bite forces. This little guy has more bite force than Juliet does. This is the way their beak is designed. They can sever that spinal vertebrae very easily. And that's how they finish off their prey. So, he's green. Um, so a little bit more about Benji um, and kind of how he came to us. Benji's story is a little bit different. Um, so he doesn't have a physical injury. He's completely 100% healthy. He can fly. Um, he can think. He can do all those other things. He doesn't have a head injury. Doesn't have wing injury. No feet. No tail. Nothing like that. But he thinks he's a person. <laughs> Birds do this neat thing called imprinting. And you ever have like baby ducks if you ever grew up, have baby chickens or baby ducks and they follow you around because they think you're mom? <laughs> very similar. Imprinting is one of those things in the scientific world that's very unknown. Not a lot of stuff is known about imprinting. Uh, but the basic gist of it is somebody found Benji when he was young, when he was a baby, and all raptors have a very short window um, to imprint. So that's when you can see their parent and figure out kind of what species they are. Unfortunately, somebody found Benji during that imprinting window. Um, and they kept him for a period of time. And he actually came into our clinic riding on a little boy's shoulder. <laughs> Just like you'd think a cockatiel or a parrot would. Uh, he's like, oh, the, the family that found him said, oh, we only had him for three days. He showed all the classical signs of heart imprinting on two people, and we're like, okay, you've had him more than three days. So it's very unlikely you had him perfectly within the imprinting window. Because the imprinting window happens only right when they can start to see. Because all raptors can't see, boom, a newspaper at a football field right away. They kind of, their eyes start all glossy and they kind of come into focus. Um, so it's very unlikely they had him in that short period of time. However, um, he is our little dude. Um, he is fully in. There you can see that head, that head motion. Yep. Focus on something. And it's just his little dance. It's the coolest thing. How did you uh, diagnose it? Yeah, so that's another one of those things that's kind of tricky. Um, imprinting in raptors is a lot of body movement, a lot of behaviors they sh it exhibit to each other. And so we had a seven kestrel summer. Um, he came in with six other babies that's, that summer last year, um, and we put him with a foster parent. We have a big foster parent program at Reggie, uh, where we have lots of species of different birds, um, great horned owls, barred owls, eagles, kestrels, that act as fostering parents. So when we do get in babies, we put them in with a foster parent right away and say, hey, this is what species you are, mom will feed you. And most raptors are very quick to take over um, a uh, orphan baby. They're very, very quick. They're very good parents. When we put Benji in with those six little kestrels and the foster parent, he would bow. And bowing is kind of one of those weird things that they don't do to each other outside of breeding season. And then he would turn and bow to people. He would flip his head upside down. He'd look at you. And that's a classic. If you ever see a bird with their head flipped upside down looking at the camera, it's a classic imprint mode. It's a classic imprint stance. Um, and so you can see he's kind of sleeping out his head. He's just hanging out looking cool. Um, but when he when he started to bow to the other chicks and he started to bow to his foster parent, they're like, it's not right. Um, or fortunately, all of his brothers and sisters, all the customers he came in with, were able to be released. We actually put him in nest boxes just south of town in that big, um, what's it called? The Point of Vista, not Point of Vista Marsh. Um, all those Kestrel boxes actually took a bunch of our babies. 
and they're all different age classes. So we got in, in contact with the band. I think her name is Jan. Got in contact with the bander, and she put them in the right age class of foxes. So it's really cool. All our, all his brothers and sisters got to go back to the wild. Uh, but he showed all the classic signs of imprinting. So I think we'll keep you. So uh, another neat thing about castors, they are one of the three species of raptors that you can tell male from female due to coloration. Okay, male castors will have that beautiful slate blue, that slate gray on their cap of their head and on their wing caps. Um, females will be that entirely brown black spot, uh, spotted coloration all over their body. Um, anybody know the other two species? Who's you guys today? So the castors one. That you can tell apart male from female from a distance. Plumage. plumage by plumage. Yeah. Northern, Harrier. Northern Harriers, one or the marsh hawk. Yep. The males would be kind of a silver ghost kind of color, um, and females would be brown. Coopers. A lot of Coopers, no? Merlin. Merlin. Merlins. Yep. Merlins, the females would be brown, brownish in color. Merlins a little bit trickier one to tell. Merlins would be, or females would be more brownish. And some males, I've seen them look silver, like a silvery blue color. But again, those are different individuals. So. Any other questions about what, what do uh, kestrels eat? What do kestrels eat? That's a very cool question. So in the summertime, uh, you can go ahead and start putting them away. Um, in the summertime, kestrels are eating primarily larger insects. That's a main base of their diet. So, Grasshoppers, June bugs, any of the bigger flying type of bugs that they can catch. Uh, however, most kestrels don't migrate. They stay here year round. Uh, but in the wintertime, are there insects? No. So they have to switch their entire diet to go after small field mice and sparrows. Some people call them a sparrow hawk. Um, one of the common names, also a shark shade, is called a sparrow hawk. Uh, but one of the common names for those guys is a sparrow hawk because they eat a lot of sparrows in the wintertime. <laughs> so that little dude. It depends on which sparrow. This is foxes around. The next guess of birds, the next species I have is no real guess of what I have in this box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it away. They're owls. OK, that's the next type of bird we're going to talk about and learn about. There are 11 species of owls that we can find in the United in, in Wisconsin. There's 11 of them. Now, I want you kind of just to turn in like little groups. <laughs> you can tell I teach kids a lot. Right? Turn in just you know, three, four, five person groups, whoever you sit next to, and try to figure out how many species you can think of. Hopefully, hopefully somebody can get 11. Okay? Do that. <laughs> Cool. I usually get like 
Better than get like four or five. And I usually say, oh, you guys can go look them up after. Because <laughs> uh, I tend to forget too sometimes. But anyways, owls are a completely different creature compared to a hawk. Um, because it has to do with the time of day they hunt. <laughs> Nocturnally, right? That's the thing, one of the major things that sets apart owls from hawks, from eagles, from falcon, is that nocturnal behavior. And so owls have a few neat adaptations that help them to do that, that they've kind of evolved over time to help them do that. Okay? The first one's in their head. The first skull I have is a hawk skull. It's a red tailed hawk skull. So it'd be just the same size as Juliet's, maybe a little bit smaller. So that's a red tailed hawk skull. And the next skull I have is a skull of a great horned owl. Okay? What's the major difference? Between the eyes. Yeah, look at the eyes. Okay? And especially look at this bony plate that surrounds the eyes. Yes, the hawk does have a bony plate. But this plate is a prominent feature on the owl's head, okay? Their eyes are actually larger than their brains. If you had the same size eyes as an owl, your eyes would be the size of grapefruit. That's how big their eyes are. Because they have such large eyes, they need to encase them in something to hold them into their skull, okay? So this bone actually holds their eye into their skull, and they also use this ring to push their eye lens against. That's what I was talking about, that zoom before. That's how they do it. They push their retina against that ring in and out, and they zoom in and out. That's how they do that zoom feature. But because they have this eye ring, and because their eye is so large, there's no room for muscles behind their eyes. So as humans, and most mammals, they can move their eyes around. I mean, we can look all kinds of, you can cross them, we can do all kinds of crazy stuff with them. Owls can't do that. So they have to be able to turn their necks a huge direction way around. So how far can an owl turn a neck around? I heard it. 370? I heard 270. And that's right. An owl can turn their head 270 degrees. Now as a human, we can get our head away. Maybe 90 degrees for our chin. Maybe a little bit more. But you think you can go more because you're cheating because your eyes are trying to go around further backwards. All can't do that. So as humans, we can get 90 degrees. A hawk, they can go 90 degrees. That's pretty easy for them. A hawk can look 180 degrees. They can look directly behind their backs without a problem. Owls take it one step further. They look 90 degrees. They look 180. And then they laugh at the hawk and say, ha ha, that was easy. And then they go at 270. So they go almost three quarters of the way around. How can you do that? They got neck, different neck muscles and different neck bones than we do. How many bones do we have in our neck? We have seven. We have seven vertebrae from the top of our, or from the bottom of our skull to the top of our shoulder. We have seven. How many does a giraffe have? Seven. They have seven. The bones are just this long. <laughs> How many does an owl have? <clears throat> they don't have seven. They have 14. An owl has 14 bones in their neck in order for that major rotation. Also, on a human, our top vertebrae has two little knobs on it that limit our skull rotation. The base of an owl is a ball and socket joint. <laughs> so they don't have those knobs on top of their vertebrae to limit their neck rotation. So they can go up. I get all the time, all kids go, oh, they can turn their neck all the way around. They can spin it all the way around. They can see in cartoons. <laughs> what would happen to your vertebrae, your, your jugular veins, your windpipe, all that stuff? I mean, kids get it pretty quick. <laughs> so their eyes are definitely one of their things. Another one their feet. So this is a foot of a hawk, a red tail hawk, just like Juliet was. Okay, you see how big your feet are? Talons. This is a foot of a great horned owl. What's the major difference, outside of size, granted are two completely different birds, what's the major difference between the hawk and the owl? Okay. Longer talons, maybe, yeah. They don't have the ones sticking out. Yeah, yeah, well you guys are more 
more advanced than our my middle schoolers. <laughs> Owls do have that third toe they can flip around, yes. What's obvious and what's the obvious difference? The fur. Wait. Fur? Feathers. There we go. It gets my kids every time too. The feathers. Yeah. They're feathery. One is for stealth. It does help with stealth. Two, owls, most owl species don't migrate. Just think of the great horned owl sitting out at one, nighttime, which is always colder than daytime, and two, in the wintertime. They're wearing a big, thick pair of wool socks, basically. It does help with silence and baffling some air going over the top, but majors insulation, keeping them warm in that winter. The next one is silence. Okay? So, when you're sneaking up on prey, you're going to be quiet, right? And especially if you're sneaking up on, at night, trying to kill a little mouse, uh, you've got to be quiet. So I do have two feathers here. This is a feather of a red-tailed hawk, one of the wing feathers. And I'm going to flap this like a red tail. We'll be flapping, and we'll see if we can hear it. I'm not sure if so it doesn't make noise. See if we can hear this. Hear that feather? It makes a lot, a lot of noise. If you can't hear it, i got a bigger demonstration. <laughs> This is a feather of a great horned owl. And the one major difference between owl feathers and hawk feathers is that they're serrated. Okay, they have a microscopic edge on the leading side. But if you look at this feather, you see how it's not perfectly straight on the stop side too? See how that's kind of got little cringies on it all over the place? Let's see if you can hear this feather. Okay. You might be able to hear it a little bit if you're close, but not nearly the same amount as the hawk feather. I got a bigger demonstration for <laughs> some of you. So, a hawk feather, okay? Remember I was talking about they're straight, they're just like a knife blade, okay? And this is just a paint stick. But when I swing this around, it catches wind and makes a lot of noise. Now, an owl feather. All kinds of fringes on it, okay? It makes some noise but not nearly the same amount as that hawk feather does. Okay? Pretty neat. You think just a couple of paint sticks. <laughs> so we're going to get our first species of bird out, and since you guys know all the species of owls, I'm not going to have you guys guess what our first species is. Come on up, big guy. So this guy's name is Fonzie. <laughs> you'll, really, you'll really laugh to find out how he got his name. Um, Fonzie is a great horned owl. Um, and now, great horns are one of the biggest species of owls we have. Yes, snowies and great greys do outweigh them, uh, but they are not here year round. The major things that sets them apart from a lot of owls are these things right here. His ear tufts, or his horns. Um, we call them ear tufts, but are they his ears? No. 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 These things are just feathers. I can push them around, he can lay them down, he can stand them up, he can do all kinds of things with those feathers. What do those feathers help him do? They don't help him hear. They help him blend in when he's trying to camouflage himself. Because when is this dude hunting? At night, what is he doing during the day? He's sleeping. And what likes to attack owls during the daytime? Crows. Flip side, what do owls like to eat at nighttime? Crows. Yeah. So when he's sitting in a tree during the daytime, say he's sitting in a big crotch of an oak tree, back face to you, you're never seeing him, okay? If you do tend to spot him, maybe sitting on a little bit not ideal situation, he can stick those horns up and the wind can blow him, just like leaves. So it helps him camouflage. Also, if he's really in danger of being spotted, he can flip him down. And he can really slim his body down and make him look not so much owl-like. Now, he's hooting at you guys. 
Anybody know why he's hooting at you guys? It's really not mating season time for the Red Raider Dolls. In his mind, it is mating season all the time. He is also an imprinted bird. Okay? That's how he got his name. Um, he was brought in as a chick, a lot like Benji was. Um, although he fell out of the nest when he was young, and he had massive internal bleeding. So we had to keep him in the clinic for long periods of time, and we did try to put him out with a foster parent. But every time we put him out with a foster parent, either he missed a perch wrong, or he, he tripped and stumbled, or whatever, and he re-triggered that internal bleeding. So we had to bring him back into the clinic, fix that internal bleeding, and we stuck him back out there. After several rounds of this in and out, in and out stuff, the foster parent actually rejected it. Because the foster parent, either one, could tell he was imprinted, or two, you keep getting re-injured, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on you. That's kind of the way it is out in the wild. It's sad, but it's true. So he spent so much time with people, we unintentionally imprinted him to us. And the way he got his name Fonzie is because all the girls in the clinic loved him. <laughs> Just like Arthur Fonzie. <laughs> Any questions about Fonzie? And he's hooting at you guys because he does think it's mating season. <laughs> and either he thinks he's a person or he thinks we're all owls. <laughs> <laughs> does he open his mouth when he hoots or is he... Yeah, so the, so there's a couple things going on. They don't open their mouth when they hoot. Their hoot is actually formed by an organ, um, and it's in his throat. And so you see that kind of white patch stick out when he hoots. Um, when he opens his mouth, and kind of that, it's called a guler flutter. When he flutters his patch like that, he's hot. They pant just like a dog. Wow. And it's hot in here. I'm sweating. I'm um, standing up here in front of all you guys. But he's hot too. He's wearing a dumb coat, you got to remember. So they do get hot very, very quickly. Um, and especially around people, they do get kind of nervous sometimes. So when he pants like that, he's just panting. He's relieving heat. So. This guy's been with us for a couple of years. Um, I think he's going on his third birthday now, aren't you? Third hatch day. Right? Yeah. So he's, he's two right now. The thing, the, the funny thing is, he hoots all day long, all night long at Reggie. He has, an out, he has like a big outside octagon enclosure. Um, he sits there and he just hoots at us walking by. He hoots at air. He hoots at a feather. Yeah, he hoots at anything. <laughs> During Green Horned Owl mating season in January, he'll still be hooting. There's a female that comes around. And he'll hoot and she'll hoot. And they have distinct hoots. Just like people have distinct voices, owls have distinct hoots. So he'll hoot, she'll hoot, he'll hoot, she'll hoot. And she'll actually come in and sit on top of his enclosure and hoot, 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 hoot. He's just hooting for the heck of hooting. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and she's like, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he's just hooting the hoot. <laughs> so eventually she gets sick of him hooting at nothing. And she does go out and we do have a resident pair of great horns that nest on the Reggie property there. So we're going to put him back. We're going to get out another of those pieces of all. He goes in his box nice and go. <laughs> the next species, since you guys do know all of them, he is the smallest species of all. Yeah, yeah. Smallest species of all. intimidating with his big glove on, doesn't he? <laughs> so this guy is Northern Solid Owl. Did you guys know? His name is Ollie. And Sawits are little neat dudes. Um, a lot of people think, oh, these are so cute, they're so cuddly. I've seen this guy swallow half a mouse. <laughs> these little guys are definitely predatory animals. They are definitely they have a mentality that they are a big owl. You know, in a small package. So, Ollie's injury is he did run into a window, uh, and he does have some issues. <laughs> he does have some brain damage, 
Um, most saw wet owls do not do good on a golf in a public setting. They just, they just don't. That's just mentality. They're a little bit high strung individual. Um, they just don't. They just don't do well. But look at him. He's not stressed out for anything. Okay. So that little hit to the head. Trigger a little bit of positive. But that leads into that leads into a good point. Who has had a bird hit their window? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, and especially you guys being an Audubon member, feels like that, you just hate to have that happen. And for kids, it's a, it's a great thing to teach about and to educate about. It's like, how many of you had a bird hit the window? And they look around, everybody's hands up in the air. Oh, why do birds hit windows? You guys know why birds hit windows? Yeah, it's reflecting the trees. And a lot of kids don't get that. A lot of kids think you can see through it. And then I lead into, you ever run into a sliding glass door? <laughs> <laughs> Same principle. It works both ways. They can either see through it and think they can go through that object, or it reflects the trees or reflects another individual of their species. Like cardinals are notorious for going after a window because they think it's a rival. Okay? We actually do, uh, we just started selling a new product at Reggie at our gift store, um, and it's actually bird tape. Um, and it's stuff you can put on your windows. They either look like hummingbirds, they look like falcons, they all kinds of different all kinds of different categories and stuff they're shaped like, or it's actually like big strips of tape. And what it does, it reflects UV rays, and birds can see into the ultra light, ultraviolet light spectrum. It's actually you know, like watch CSI and they shine a black light and it glows, same kind of spectrum. So that tape you put on your window, and the birds kind of like, oh hey, there's something there, and they fly away. So it's a very good teaching opportunity for kids to talk about why birds hit windows. Another thing we can do, these guys. Okay? Pop bottle rings. What's the best thing to do with pop bottle rings? Well, one, don't buy them. But two is to cut them. Okay? Cut each and every little hole. That's the best thing. Because um, we always go, what would happen if this little guy got stuck on his head? You know, if he couldn't get it off. Did he pop out? The last one, you can see here he's panting again. He's doing that little cooler, cooler fluttering, call it. Um, yeah, you're hot, I know, it's hot in here. So we're gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and put him away, just for conservation of the animal. Um, I'm gonna put him away, and we will. Do questions in a bit. Another thing, another thing we really like to stress about, um, and kind of how you can help uh, wildlife, is fishing line. And if you follow Reggie on Facebook or follow Reggie on our, on our website or whatever, um, you've seen we have had several fishing line cases this year. And this is one I always like to um, show off. I need to get a new bag. Intern. Um, <laughs> I told my summer interns we need a new bag. Until I get a new bag. But anyways, you can see there's a water and there's a bunch of fishing line in this bag. There's a bobber and there's a bunch of fishing line wrapped up in this bag. Okay? This fishing line and this bobber actually came in on a patient. It came wrapped around a bald eagle. And it was wrapped around this eagle so tight, this bird couldn't move. It couldn't open its wings, it couldn't really do anything. Now if somebody, we call it flu. Uh, if somebody hadn't have been there to find that bird and keep it, that bird would have died. It would either got succumbed to another predator or starvation or something along those lines. <coughs> Earlier this summer, we had a loon come in. And this, one of the loons we had to come in to fish, and then we had a couple. One of them, he had the fishing line wrapped around his beak, and it was actually wrapped around his tongue. Oh. And I don't know if you guys know anything about like the loon morphology of their tongue. They actually have a knob three quarters of the way back on their tongue that they use to push the fish against the top of their mouth. It kind of feels like sandpaper, kind of like a cat's tongue. And it uses to push the fish down their throat. That's what they use that knob for. That fishing line wrapped around the knob of his tongue, wrapped around his tongue, and then he had his beak shut and wrapped around his beak. So he couldn't open his beak at all. And once we got the fishing line cut off his beak, we opened his mouth, took his tongue off. Oh my God, it's wrapped around his tongue too. And it was wrapped around his tongue so bad we thought it might take the tongue off. We thought it might, the blood flow had been reduced so much the tongue might fall off, and then the bird would have died. Uh, we would have had to put the bird down because the bird can't eat, finally let it go. Um, but we did, 
Unfortunately, when they get to that tongue soon enough, we got it all cut off, got it all out of there, restored the blood flow, um, fed him up, and he released him. And he's, it was a great thing to watch him swim away and die away. Um, so, we also got a pelican. We got a white pelican in. Um, we actually traded for him. Maybe it was like a bird trade thing. Um, like people like trade baseball cards. Um, we actually were working with Bay Beach Wildlife Facility in Green Bay. Yeah. You know Bay Beach. Um, we traded him two cranes for a pelican. It kind of like, oh, we're trading birds now, huh? Yeah. Um, but it was, they needed cranes and we wanted a pelican for an education. And so he actually had fishing line wrapped around his right, right? Right or left? I don't know, 50 50 shot. Um, had it wrapped around his wing, and it actually got so tight it did cut off the blood flow, and it amputated his wing. So now we have a pelican with one wing. He comes out on tours in the summertime, and he'll walk right up to people. You can throw him fish, and he'll catch it. And he's just the happiest pelican you can ever see. <laughs> but he only has one wing for fishing line. And we stress that to kids every time. This animal. This boat died from fishing line. And so I challenge everybody here, I challenge all my kids, next time you go to a dock, next time you go to the boat landing, next time you go everywhere, look for fishing line. Even if it's your own fishing line, you're cutting pieces off to change hooks, whatever, collect that line and throw it away, dispose of it properly. Myself, I went out fishing the first time I went out, I put my boat in the landing, I found 300 yards of fishing line at the landing. It looked like somebody bought a new spool and just spun it in the grass and took it all off. I did the responsible thing, cooked it up, and I kept a bag. I have a gallon-sized bag in my truck. It's completely filled with fishing line just from this summer. That's how much line. I didn't even walk any. I just, just put my boat in and oh, there's some. Picked it up. So I challenge everybody, I challenge all my kids to look at fishing line. Because I've seen way too many birds come in with fishing line wrapped around them. They kind of want to stop that. And a lot of boat landings have gotten a lot better at putting little tubes where you can stick fishing line in. A lot of the more maintained boat landings, but a lot of the rugged ones, they don't have anything. So. You talk to the anglers about this? Yeah, so we do we do sportsman shows, we do all kinds. We did like the Muscle Lunge Club in Rhinelander one time. Um, we did all we do all kinds of stuff like that. Sportsmen, we do stress this, and we also stress using non lead non lead ammunition. Uh, that's a big sore point for us. We have plenty of eagles die every year from lead poisoning. Um, we stress all this natural stuff. And that's where it's got to start. It's got to start at the angler. It's got to start at the hunter uh, level and then work its way up. I can't go to old Scott Walker and talk him into doing it. Uh, it's, you know, a whole lot of work. Uh, so it's got to start with us. It's got to start with a group of people like you guys. It's got to start with somebody kickstarting this whole thing. And then that's how it works. And it works its way up and then it finally becomes a nationwide deal. That's kind of how it works. So, any questions for me before I take off? Yeah. Um, I'm so impressed with the great work you do, and you're such a unique facility. Is I mean, how how much do you depend on us for your funding, and how can we help you? Um, a couple million dollars would be fine. Yeah. So actually, we rely on public a lot more than I care to say. Um, we have a very small staff. We have a staff of four rehabbers um, and two educators. And this is me and Abby's full-time job. Um, and sometimes we're in two different places with eight different birds doing programs like this. Um, and our rehabbers are just swamped. Uh, I, mean, we, I mean, you're talking about four people taking care of 300 birds. That's amazing. And I'm not paid the greatest. I mean, I'll, I'll say that right now. Um, we are a nonprofit 501c3 company. So that means we, we're not eligible for state funding, we're not eligible for federal funding, we're not eligible for any funding whatsoever, except for competitive grants um, and other things like that. Private donations for people just like you is how we stay afloat. Doing programs just like this is how we fund our operations at Red If you guys find an injured bird, we rely on you guys to bring it to us. We don't have, I mean, think about it. We have four people, and we have 300 birds to take care of. Somebody calls in with a bird. We're just going to lose a person? You know, I mean, that one person's taking care of 100 birds themselves. 
we're just going to drop them and go get a bird. I mean, we want to. More, you know, more than anything, we want, we want to drop everything and go rescue a bird. That's what we kind of set out to do. But in all reality, we can't. So we do, re we do rely on the public people. Uh, we, really, we have lots of volunteer transporters for Reggie. Um, so some, we have a big list of people from Wausau, from Point, from Madison, from all over the state that if we have a bird in the area, that say it's in Rhinelander and that's an hour away from us, we'll call up one of our volunteer transporters in Rhinelander and say, hey, can you pick up this bird for us? But if it's a Wednesday midday, they're more than likely at work and they can't drop everything into it too. So it's a very difficult balancing game we play. Um, we do work with the Fish and Wildlife, we do work with the DNR, and they do help out. Uh, we do get carcasses from the DNR, we do get, like, people shoot, shoot a deer illegally, they will donate the deer to us through the DNR, um, stuff like that. But the public is how we, how we stay alive, basically, so a couple million dollars would be really nice. <laughs> yeah. uh, just to let the membership know, we did make a decent donation to Reggie last year, the board did. On using chapter funds, and I suspect we'll be considering continuing that to a certain level. Yeah. And how many books we sell right now. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say too. If you guys didn't know all your owl, there's a great book right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard that uh, you might move to Wausau. Is that just a rumor? That is a very good question. Again. <laughs> A couple million dollars would help. Um, I will say this without, I can't say anything formally, but there is a vision. We do have a vision for Reggie and the, and the way it's going to move. Um, let it be to Wausau, let it be to Point. You know, there's so many options to which way we can go. We do have a vision for where we're going to move Reggie in the future. Um, I'll just say, I'll say that. I can't really say much more. We haven't really made anything public. We haven't made any decisions yet. We haven't even really met with a lot of people to see if it, it can be possible. But we do have a vision for Reggie, and it is moving forward. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Is there any kind of protocol for transporting protected species? I think if Joe six pack can't pick one up, drive it up to you without running some risk of the DNR saying, yeah, that's not such a good idea. Yeah, so we get people like that all the time, saying, oh, I got a bald eagle, and I, I don't want to take this thing, I don't want to touch it, because I'll get in trouble, the DNR will pull me over, and I'll get a thousand million dollar fine. We get that all the time. As long as you, if you call us and say, hey, I have a bald eagle, you have 24 hours underneath our permits to get it to us. You hold it any more than that, you're liable for all the other good stuff. But under our permits, I can issue you a 24-hour holding thing. So if you are two hours away, it's like 10 o'clock at night, I found it when I got home, you can keep it overnight. That's fine. Keep it in a cardboard box and then bring it to us the next day. We give you 24 hours on our federal permits in order to do that. So, and you can transport anything that way. Peregrines, bald eagles, golden eagles, any bird that we have, like any bird we have permits for, which is every one of them, <laughs> you can transport for us 24 hours. So, yeah. Here's on your note about the vision and possible yeah. move to another site. How many rehab sites are there now in, in the state and where are they? Other rehab places in the state. Um, there is one in Manapa, it's Northwoods. Uh, they do take some birds. There are, let me put it this way there are very few places that do just birds uh, in the country. Most other places do squirrels, they do rabbits, they do raccoons, they do other deer and other things like that. Um, in Wisconsin, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head where exactly everyone are, uh, everyone is, but I think there's two or three other ones that do take birds. Uh, we are one of the very few that take eagles. The eagles is a whole other level of permitting um, and have the know-how and knowledge to work with them. Uh, so the only other place that does a lot of raptor work is the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. Um, those, that's the only other place that does like a large number of raptors a year. So Northwoods Wildlife Center in Monaco does some. Uh, we also get a lot of birds from them. If they're full up, they bring birds to us. Um, so and we work with them back and forth. You know, if they have if they have a 
pair of this rear duct, say, and we have a baby, we'll transfer it over so they can be with the parent. You know, we'll, we'll always do stuff like that. Um, it's always for the betterment of the bird. vehicles, a lot of vehicle collisions. Last year we had one hit by a train. Um, he survived. He was released last spring, so that was cool to see him fly away. Um, yeah, vehicle collisions, poisonings, um, lead poisoning, organophosphate poisoning from spring fields and people lacing deer carcasses for coyotes and wolves, stuff like that. Um, the gamut. Uh, eaglets. We have nine eaglets, I think, from this spring. Um, fell in a nest, fireworks, scare them out, anything like that, nest fell over. Um, so it's such a wide range. Shot, um, anything like that. So. Mark has heard uh, a vulture that she loves to take with her and he loves applause. You have to applaud. Oh, yeah. Him. It's probably Maury. Yeah, yeah that was good. Is he still there, right? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, Maury's still there. He still bites you every time. <laughs> <laughs> one last one, yeah. Do you have a product name for that window treatment uh, that you, off the top of your head, or? Uh, I just, I just met with the rep the other day too. Do you have it on your website? Our website's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, we have an old website, and some of you have probably seen the old one, the green with the pan. Uh, we are actually writing a new website right now, and I'm getting pictures and putting pictures on the website, and, and it's me. Um, so it's a slow work in progress, but it will be up on our new website. I think it's called Bird Alert. But type in bird window clings or bird preventative window clings in Google, and it will come right. It's the first major company there that comes up. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm 20 minutes over. I know I started late, but thank you, everybody, for coming out and seeing this.